Okay, we're starting the um, half of the book where we talk about CSS. It's actually, uh, I think, a little bit more than half the book that is CSS. So we spent the first half talking about the structure of a website, and then now we are uh, going to deal a lot with the design of it. Our websites look really plain. Uh, and now with CSS, we're going to make them look a lot nicer. From the web design folder, CIS152, I have the template file in there. So you want to set yourself up. By now, you should know what to do. Uh, grab that template, create a folder with today's date on your flash drive, and we'll work on the on the project that way. Uh, you can uh, plug it into any computer at any point. There. So I'm going to uh, create a new folder with today's date. And I'm going to copy the template file and change it to today's date. And then on that copy, you can right click and edit with Notepad. So you should have the template file. You can change that up just a little bit there uh, with your information at the end. We're starting to work with CSS and we need some sort of project to, to work with. So uh, let's say for title. We'll call this my So we'll make this project called My Favorite Music. This will be My Favorite Music, H1, My Favorite Music. Project My Favorite Music. Today's date, a CSS focused project. So, whatever you want to write in the comments is fine because, again, the comments are uh, for yourself. Page 227. Uh, in this section, you'll, we'll look at how to make your website look more attractive controlling the design using CSS. CSS allows you to create rules that specify how the content of an element should appear. So we'll use those terms of rule, uh, properties, selectors. There's a lot of jargon that will come into this uh, chapter. For example, you can specify that the background of the page is a certain color, all paragraphs should appear as another color with a different font, or that level one heading should appear blue. Once you've learned how to write a CSS rule, learning CSS mostly involves learning the different properties you can use. So again, you don't need to know every single property. It's helpful to know the properties off the top of your head when you want to make 
changes and such, but if you don't, you can always look them up. We've experimented with a few different properties here and there. Let's do this. Um, let's uh, after the H1, we'll write a paragraph and just make something up quick about these are my top favorite uh, uh, music and bands and genres and um, artists. Uh, these songs and albums are what define my life. They mean a lot to me. Just some content so that we have something to work with. The key to understanding how CSS works is to imagine that there is an invisible box around every HTML element. So 229 mentions the, uh, the box. This is the box model. There's an invisible box around every element. And we can actually see those boxes in the web browser. So I'm going to save that and go ahead and run it in your browser launch Firefox this that we have is very basic but it's enough for us to see the box model that it talks about in the in the book page 230 here I am in uh, Firefox this looks really plain. There's an invisible box around everything. Every paragraph, every image, every H1, every link. And we can see it this way in the browser. If you right-click on anything, such as a word, I'm going to right-click on music. Most browsers will have this, so Chrome or Firefox will work just fine. You should have something that says Inspect Element. So right click inspect element. Depending on your browser, uh, it'll appear on the bottom or the right. And we might have seen this before. This was the developer's console. And what happens is at the bottom, I get the code of the project. But when you hover over the different pieces, you should see stuff highlighting at the top. And that's a way to see the box model that the book is talking about. If I hover over body, a box appears around the whole body of the document. If I hover over H1, there's a box there. If I click on it, uh, we will get various CSS rules on the side over here. The P also is like that. There's a box around everything. Well, this is useful for us to understand what's inside of another element, because when we get to CSS, we will see that uh, this is the second most complicated one because of the interlocking pieces. Well, let's try this. If you click on body, on the right side, it says there are no rules, no CSS, no extra CSS that is affecting the body. If you click where it says element, just anywhere there, it should then let you start typing. For example, background color. And as I start typing, it'll pop up with all the possible CSS rules that I can use. So if I do pop background color, tab, and then I get a bunch of uh, options for colors, I'll just choose you know, aqua press enter and it changed it all to a color if I hover over the h1 again I can write CSS and we'll do this in our notepad in a moment here I'm going to show you in the web browser you actually have a way to edit CSS you can right click inspect element and that'll open up the uh, the inspector 
click on there and I can write something again like background color and do red and I'm making some changes well this is temporary this is not changing my original HTML this is just like a, a scratch pad because if I refresh the page it goes away whatever I wrote here uh, was not permanent but this is very useful to figure out what is the color or what is the value or how many pixels or what do I what CSS rule do I need to write to change things how I want Page 230, CSS allows you to create rules that control the way that each individual box and the contents of that box is presented. Let's go back to, the, to Notepad and let's say for some words inside of your first paragraph, I'm going to add a span around them. wrap span span tag around something of the text that you wrote you save it and run it and then do right click inspect which is actually the same as F12 doing the F12 uh, key for the developers console it's the same sort of panel but if you add a span, save it, and run it, and now see your, your code, there's this extra box now around that. So there's the box of the whole body, there's the box of the H1, the box of the P tag, and the box of the span. So there are these invisible boxes throughout. So uh, visually, uh, nothing changes in that little spot. But if I do right click, if I right click, I see there is a box there. So the span that I wrote, it's its own box where I can uh, write rules, CSS rules, to affect that. When I make changes over here, it pops up to say, well, look at that. That was just adding style attribute to that element. We've talked about uh, block level elements and inline level elements before. That's page 229 and 230, basically. Next, 231, CSS associates style rules with HTML elements. So you have a really cool screen or page there that explains these concepts of selector and declaration. Let's uh, do that. If we go back to your code, uh, we we wrote inline uh, CSS before, which, which we should avoid. Instead, we will write um, embedded CSS. So let's back up to the head block and add a new style tag. CSS style. That's the that's the um, the comment in CSS, the comment in HTML. We remember what that one looks like, and the comment in CSS is So, 
terminology. Selector, declaration, property, value. We'll come back to define them in just a moment, but let's write body space curly braces. CSS works by, by associating rules with HTML elements. Associating rules with HTML elements. These rules govern how the content of specified elements should be displayed. A CSS rule contains two parts, a selector and a declaration. So inside a body, background, color, uh, purple, semicolon. But here's a CSS rule. Anywhere the body tag exists, let's declare the property of background color its value to be set to purple so based on what I wrote there the selector is body the declaration is everything inside the curly braces the property is background color and the value is purple selecting the tag body. So we're declaring some things about it. In particular, a property of background color and the value of the background color is purple. We've seen uh, that we can affect the color of text. That declaration has two properties now, a background color and a text color. So this rule is affecting the background color and the text color. Selectors indicate which elements the rules apply to. The same rule can apply to more than one element if you separate the element names with commas. Declarations indicate how the elements referred to in the selector should be styled. Declarations are split into two parts, a property and a value. And there's a, there's a semicolon between each pair of property and value. And there's a colon between the um, property so if you save and run that, get a background color change with a text color change. We did this. Uh, we did something like this previously, although we had a dot at the beginning. If you remember, a long time ago, last week, uh, we had a we had a uh, a rule with a dot. We'll come back. Well, why did we use a dot? We'll come back to that as the chapters go on. But that's the end of the first chapter, introducing CSS. The big idea is. Uh, the syntax of the code is like this, some sort of selector with a declaration. Then we've got properties and values. That could have been written broken up like this. I can break each of these into its own line. Maybe tab this for readability. This will be most common what we do. You don't have to do that right now. But that's going to be most common what, the way we'll do it, because we'll usually have several properties that we're affecting in a, in a declaration. 
So I'm going to keep it on one line, but both of them are the same. Two thirty five and two thirty six are very important pages. The first one talks about using external CSS, and the second page talks about using internal CSS or embedded. Uh, usually, you want to do what's on two thirty five, which is to link to a file that is devoted to CSS. Um, this way is embedded, and it's a very quick way to do it, but uh, it's going to be better to put it all on its own external file. That way you can link that one file to multiple HTML documents. The link element can be used in an HTML document to tell the browser where to find the CSS file used to style this page. So let's say we'll practice with that also. Um, after we'll back up here um, title you've got the title of the document you've got a style block before that let's add the link tag so we do have a tag called link but it's not really linking from one page to another its purpose basically is to link to an external CSS file and it needs basically a, an REL attribute specifies the relationship between the HTML page and the file linked to. The value should be style sheet. So we're about to make a link uh, to some file. The relationship is that this file we're linking to is a style sheet href hypertext reference we've seen that before uh, we're gonna link to some file we'll call it my CSS uh, my style dot CSS The book mentions the type attribute. Don't worry about the type attribute. This is to specify what type of file are we connecting to. Not necessary anymore. This is one of these older concepts that now it's not quite necessary. So that's all you need right there to link to an external CSS file. Making a note how to link to an external CSS file. Well, this is not complete. This is just linking or trying to link to a file that has CSS, but that file does not exist. That file is assumed to exist in the same folder as our current project. In my current project, all that I have here is today's HTML file, and I'm trying to link to my style CSS. It doesn't exist. So in Notepad, we will create this file and save it in the same folder as the HTML file, so that the HTML file can find the CSS file. So here in Notepad, let's go to File New. We should call this My Style. Uh, let's go to File Save As. We should call this My Style. My Style dot CSS. No, this time we're saving it as .css. So on the save as type, you should see cascade, which is a misspelling, cascading style sheet. So let's save it as my style.css, save as type, cascading style sheet, cascading style sheet file.
Now we've got two documents open at one time and they're separated by tabs my HTML file and my CSS file uh, I would like to look at them at once and we can do that if you right click the tab of your second file there's a cell phone ringing that sounds kinda loud could someone uh, deal with that please So if you right click that CSS file and select move to other view, we can see two files at one time. So on the left side I can see the HTML file and on the right side I can see the CSS file. You can put it back by right click move to other view again. So in the CSS file, you can write a comment, only CSS goes in this file. So in the CSS file, we should only write CSS. In the HTML file, we can write HTML and CSS and JavaScript. But actually, we should really write CSS in a CSS file and JavaScript in a JavaScript file. Keep them separate. Then we link from one to the other. Let's say then, p tag, curly braces, background color, yellow. So I'm saying select the p tags in the document and set their and declare uh, their background color properties to have a value of yellow. We've got two files to work with now. They both must be saved for this to work. It's telling me here this one has not been saved and this one has not been saved. You might as well get used to using this button here, save all. So this one here, save all. You're working with more than one file perhaps. They all need to be saved before this will show up in the browser. It's also got a keyboard shortcut, uh, Control Shift S. You may have used Control S to save. Now remember Control Shift S to save everything. What you also have to pay attention to now, if I run this to view it, don't run the CSS file because it'll say great there's your CSS when you do run in the browser make sure you're running the HTML file because I went to run Firefox get my CSS file and it shows up working with it here running CSS says, there's your CSS you want to run your HTML file pause here you should see the background color that we defined in the HTML file and then now you should see the the paragraph background color that we defined in the CSS file. Does everyone see that? If not let me know because you don't have a link properly perhaps.
Okay, so here uh, we've got examples of both external and internal CSS. At the left here, this style block, we should write internal CSS. Now, I'm not going to have my split screen most of the time because my screen is a lot smaller than yours. I'm going to switch between the screens, but that's how you can open double panels there. So. In the uh, HTML file, just writing that this is internal CSS, also known as embedded, because we can have CSS. Remember when we did style equals, we can have inline CSS and then embedded CSS, which is all internal to this file. Then the other file is external CSS. Which is more common to well, more better to use is external. Uh, this is the one you usually want to do, although it takes more setup, right? You need to create another file, make sure that that file is saved in the same folder as the HTML, link to the CSS file in the HTML file, but it is better because then you can reuse this CSS file on multiple HTML files. Uh, page 237, 238 is a little complicated. I'll come back to that one in one moment. I'm going to jump instead to 239, how CSS rules cascade. Well, what if we do this? In the CSS file, we've uh, written the P tag, basically affect all paragraphs with this background color. That's what that means. Let's back up before that paragraph and say body background color red now another uh, reason to do external CSS especially in notepad is I didn't have the cool color coding that I had in the HTML file notepad sees mostly HTML in this HTML file so we get all of the color coding and he helps and hints and all of that but when we have a dedicated CSS file, Notepad sees that, and now we get the colors so that we can properly code. So here, I've defined body twice in the HTML file and in the CSS file. Save it and run it, and let's see which one wins, because we've said the same thing twice. run it, I get purple. If there are two or more rules that apply to the same element, it's important to understand which will take precedence. Page 239, last rule. If the two selectors are identical, the latter of the two, the second of the two, will take precedence. So in our case, purple one. In my case, purple one. The second one, because the browser opens this code and starts to process it from top to bottom. So the web browser gets to this line and takes a moment to jump to this file and processes all of this. This gets to the end and the browser comes back and continues. So then the next things that are processed is this. So this body was the last one to be processed. And that's why purple won. Just for fun, if I move the link after style block, so now I've got style uh, internal first, and then I've got style external second, red. So the order of these things will matter now in CSS. You saw when, when link was first, purple one. Now you see when link is last, red wins. So I'm going to leave it. 
first and make a note. Order of your CSS matters. And I'm writing it in capital letters because it might be important. It is important to the order of your CSS. If you have the same rule, the last one wins. It looks like in Chrome, external comes first, all the time. It shouldn't. It shouldn't because uh, that is definitely against the um, the specifications of CSS, and that's Chrome going rogue. You know, the real rules are the order it should be like this, and I don't doubt it because standards are great because everyone can make their own standard. So when I, do, when I do it in Chrome, it's, it's right. It's purple first. Huh. Then I move the link and then it was right. You might have to confirm that all your files are saved because it should be that uh, it is in the order. So if you have the same rule, the last one wins. Or if you have a more specific rule, it wins. This is a little more complex to, to, to show you. So the way we'll, I'll show you about specificity is um, let's do this. We have back on the HTML. We have a span where it says define my life. We wrote span around those words. Let's also write a span around the word favorite. Open span, close span. Now, this rule is targeting the body, everything. This rule is targeting the paragraph there. Let's say in the HTM, in the CSS file, create a rule called span. Background color brown. Text uh, color, regular color, text color white. Save both files and run it to see the result. Okay, so if you then see this in the browser, with this span, this span rule is being applied to all instances of where span exists. This is the power of CSS in that once you've set it up the right way, you change, in the future, you change a little bit to make lots of changes. So because I've used span more than once, that CSS rule applies more than once. Can we use the ID span? We can. Okay. That's the specificity that we're, that we're, that we're getting to. So. Uh, we've used IDs before, and we'll use something else called classes and all of that in a moment. But here, I wasn't specific enough to say which 
span I'm really trying to affect. So let's do this. After this span, let's write P space span and then a background and a text color. I'm just going to copy that and paste it and change it to something else, something maybe green and white. And now save it and contrast it with this. Regular span P space span. If one selector is more specific than the others, the one that's more specific will take precedence over more general rules. So checking that result. The second span is the one that changes. In this syntax of what I've written, this is when we back up one page to explain selectors in a moment. But I'm being more specific here. Basically, I'm saying look for a paragraph space and then look for a span and then declare properties and values. So these are called selectors because that's what's happening. Look for the, the web browser will be instructed, look for the body tag, select the body tag, and then declare some properties and values. Look for or select the P tag, any P tag, and declare the following. Look for a span. More specific, look for a paragraph, and if there's a span inside of the paragraph, do the following. There was a span inside of H1 that was unaffected. that span right there. It's inside of an H1. So it was ignored. That one took, took uh, precedence. So writing notes here. General. Or generic. Applies to all spans. Specific. More specific. Applies only to certain spans. Let's add a little bit more content in the HTML file so that we can edit via CSS or control via CSS. We've got an H1, my favorite music. Uh, let's then make up a couple of H2s. Let's uh, maybe mention some bands. We'll mention some bands that you like and then a little paragraph below it, a little bit about the band. So you can number it if you want or whatever, but I'm just going to write some bands, some musical groups. Just some content to work with.
just a little bit of content. Now, this is obviously now a terrible choice of colors because I can barely read it. Uh, but all paragraphs have become yellow with white text. Very easy way to fix that. I'm going to change that to black text. Uh, black text on yellow background will be much more readable than white text on yellow background. So P, background color. Now, before I change that, this again relates to these, these concepts. Um, I'm having a hard time reading the white text on the yellow background. But if I look at my CSS, nowhere did I actually specify that there is white uh, that there is that there is white text in the paragraph. I said a yellow background in the paragraph, but I never said white text. This is page two forty inheritance. If you specify the font or color of the body, they will apply to most child elements. This is because the value of those is inherited by child elements. It saves you from having to apply these properties to many elements. So in, uh, in the inline, in the embedded CSS, that's when we said the color of text, white. So CSS works furthermore with the concept of child elements and parent elements. Uh, in the HTML, the parent element is body. Everything is below it. Then we've got child elements that are below that. Conceptually and literally, yes, this text is literally below this text. But conceptually, all of these elements all relate to this body. Just because this one is below this one doesn't mean it's necessarily a child. Uh, all of these elements are children of this parent element. So we said body, text color white, and everything else inherited, just like in real life. You inherited probably your eye color from your parents or your hair color, etc. Inheritance. So CSS passes on its properties, the parent element to the child element. This goes back to how this works. Specificity. We weren't very specific, actually, about color early on. And then what happened is that all of the paragraphs get the yellow and the white. Now I want to redefine that and specify that I actually want black text, yellow background. So that is if I change my paragraph, if I add one more property and value, background color, text color. So the order mattered. The order mattered about when I wrote it, but then also here specificity. I'm specifying the P tag, which is more specific than the body tag. The body's affecting everything. The P tag is affecting child elements. And I can read that. And this again goes into the complexity of CSS because we see that inheritance exists, that some elements will be inherited by other elements. That's not going to be obvious sometimes. Why didn't this one change when this one did change? It might not be a child element. It might be a sibling element. So again, the complexity of CSS will be very evident very soon. We have all of these, um, all of this content so far. Back on the CSS file. Now we can look at page 237. There are many different types of CSS selectors. 
that allow you to target rules to specific elements in the HTML document. That page shows a great example of just having a lot of content and then also using IDs and classes. And page 238 mentions the different types of selectors, universal type or tag selector, class ID, child, descendant, adjacent sibling, and general sibling. So there's lots of ways to select. This body, everything we've written so far, body, these are the type selector or tag selector targets valid HTML tags. Any example of P? is going to be edited. Any example of span is going to be edited. It's going to be targeted. So type selected. We're selecting a tag, basically. Any tag that exists. One of the requirements in the homework that is due today is to use the address tag. We didn't talk about it in person, but I said to look at it in the book. So the address tag, that's another way to that we can write some rules here. We can have the tag of address and change its color and font and such. Type selector. We're selecting a type of tag. Going to the end, we'll say dot h2 style curly braces. This is a class selector. targets all elements with this class. A type selector will find an example of that HTML tag and edit it or specify it. This one needs to work with classes. We need to add the class attribute to an HTML tag. Notice the dot. This matches an element whose class attribute has a value that matches the one specified after the period symbol, the dot. So I spelled it here with a capital S. I then want to apply this in the HTML. I want all my heading twos. to look a certain way, but then I want a certain h2 to look a different way. So h2 for your third musical group will add an attribute of class h2 tag has a class of h2 style. Spell it exactly the same as your CSS file. When you, when you run this, you should see one of the uh, h2's changes. So we've seen a little bit of this before, the class selector. Now we're kind of defining it more in the book. The 
purpose of this is to sort of group different things together so that we can style them the same way. So anywhere that I use the class of H2 style, it will change here. I'm going to go inside of um, somewhere on my first paragraph and highlight something with span and add that class. So if I go back to the HTML file and add span to something in my first paragraph. Well, we've seen a moment ago that all spans get a certain look. But this span, I'm going to add the class attribute of h2 style. And we'll take that, those values. That's right, so if I want to target all H2s, I would need a type selector. I'm selecting all, all tags of type H2. Okay. The next one that we have is the ID selector. Targets only one element. ID. So a class can be used many times, an ID only one time per document. This one has the hash mark. Yes? So all the different selectors go combined? They, we often use them all. Uh, a kind of a selector that is a that is a tag and in a class and ID. We we have to figure out ourselves which is the best one to use for what task. I mean, like, so we just did the span one. Mm -hmm. How it combines both the class and the ID. Mm -hmm. So we just did the span one. How it combines both the class and the ID. So we just did the span one. How it combines both the class and the ID. So we just did the span one. How it combines both the class and the ID. So we how specific is it? How you add the class, where you add the class. But it does combine because of inheritance. Remember, uh, everything got the same uh, color for a moment until I changed it. So it often combines things because of inheritance until we change it. Let's say here um, important text. Do you see how Notepad is giving you different colors? So, the pair, uh, plain old HTML tags look like that. Classes look like that. IDs look like that. This is just another way to keep track of what kind of code I've written. And so, with an ID, it targets only one element. So it can only be used once per document.
And this is when I add the ID attribute to something. So I've got three paragraphs. Or, uh, yeah, three paragraphs. To the last paragraph, I'll add an ID, the ID that I just wrote, important text. Notice that the dot is not here when I've got a class, and the pound sign is not here when I have the ID. In the HTML, this is the dot, and this is the hashtag. In the CSS file, the dot means class, and the hash mark means ID. So don't write the hash mark in the HTML file in this case, or the dot for the class. So all P's were yellow a moment ago, and now this one is gold. And you should only use an ID once per document. So if I copy this ID and put it on another element, it may change. The browser may change. It's very difficult to see on the projector, but that's gold and that's yellow. It may change like this. I did use ID in two places, but you shouldn't. This is wrong. The browser may be lenient and apply the change, but it should not. You should only use an ID one time in your document. This is now doing the, the work of a class. The purpose of the class is to be able to reuse it. The purpose of the ID is that it should only be applied once per document. So even if it maybe did change, that's not right. You should only use the ID one time document. What are instances of things on a website that maybe appear only once? The title of the document. What about at the very bottom of a document? Oftentimes there's a, there's a copyright at the bottom of the page. Maybe I need to style that a certain way. So things that only appear once. The nav bar. I usually don't have you know four nav bars. I might have one at the top. So some elements that only exist once in the document, that's a great way to, that's a great reason to use an ID. Elements that exist many times in the document, that's where I would use a class. The big ones that I want to talk about at the moment are the um, the type selector, class selector, and ID selector. Page two thirty eight. Uh, mentions more of them. I say be sure to read and memorize pages 237 and 238 because we're going to go on. Uh, it's very conceptual at this point to look at those two pages. It'll be better to actually do it with some content. So you look at 237 and 238, it gives you a very good example on the left side of a document with a lot of tags and how they're used or styled on page 238. H241 uh, answers why you should use external CSS. You read that on your own and basically uh, centralizing all your CSS code in one file is better because then if I've got a home page, home.html, a contact page, contact.html, a products page, products.html, and I want to style them all the same it's very inefficient to write all of that CSS code 
in a style block because I need the same style block on all three HTML files. And then I decide to change the background color of my whole site. Well, I would need to go to the background color of three separate files. Home HTML, contact HTML, products HTML. And I would need to change the body tag for each one of them because they're separate files. The better way to do it is I put all my CSS rules in one file, and then I link to all from all the HTML files to that one CSS file. Then I just change the CSS file, and automatically all those changes trickle down or cascade to all the files. And so CSS, cascading style sheets, is that. There's a cascade. What is the order? What takes precedence? What, what matters? What applies? The cascade from top to bottom and specificity. The C, style. Well, that's design. The colors, the backgrounds, the drop shadows, everything that defines the style. And then sheets, well, it's a file. Maybe CSF might have made more sense, cascading style file. But CSS style sheets, because we can have em embedded CSS, external CSS, inline CSS. So CSS is the design of things. Page 242, you can skip that page. That talks about quirks mode. CSS was invented in 1996, and web browsers have been evolving. And some browsers wouldn't understand some of the code, so you have to write it in a special way, quirks mode. Uh, by now, all the browsers are pretty compatible, so you don't have to worry about page 242. You can read it, but you don't have to worry about it. Then the chapter ends. Is chapter 10. That's the tip of the iceberg because the big complexity of CSS is what, what do I write? Do I write a tag? Do I write a class? Do I write an ID? There's also things about child elements and sibling selectors that you should look at. But to make it make sense, we, we should actually you know, do it. That's chapter 10. Any general questions about CSS or chapter 10 so far? The next chapters are very hands-on, where they talk about how to uh, write CSS. Chapter 11 is how to write CSS to affect color. Chapter 12 is how to write CSS to a affect text, and so forth. Chapter 13, chapter 14, how to write CSS to affect tables. 15 is pretty complex. When we get to that one, it's about layout. 16 is images. So these chapters are going to then focus on what's the right tag for the right task. We've got a chapter 11 all about what are the proper tags when you want to affect color. If you look at page 249, 250, we've done that over and over. We've written color, the color property, to affect text color. We've been writing colors with a named keyword, but we also have colors that we can write as a formula. Let's say uh, P. background color yellow enter background color RGB parentheses semicolon 255 comma 0 comma 0 here now I'm writing a color formula This is writing it in RGB. This expresses color in terms of how much red, green, and blue are used to make the color. So here I'm mixing 255 units of red, 0 units of green, 
from zero to an answer blue. It's going to be a bright red color. It goes from zero to 255. Now I wrote two background color properties. Which one wins? The last one, RGB, because of the cascade. So it was obvious which body won, now that we understand that. The other body wins because it's last. Here, it should be obvious also. We define background color twice. Yellow then red. Red wins. Second. And so the red that I, that I simply type the name red might not be the right red for my company colors. Maybe I've got you know, a red that is that strong with then a little bit of blue like that. That's my red. This red is not my red. This, one, this is my color of red for my company. 200 out of 255, red, no green, little bit of blue. Well, I, I've been doing this for a long time, since about 2001. I cannot mix color formulas in my head. So there's plenty of websites out there. RGB, let's see what we can look up. Uh, HTML RGB color mixer. I haven't looked this up, but there's probably going to be a million websites that has this answer. So looking at this website, get this color plus that color, or this color plus that color, and I want that color. I want that color for my company. Well, this is giving it to me in a different way, actually. but. These are color formulas. That's the HTML code, right? It's giving you HTML. All of these are HTML code for that color. Now, actually, I was looking for RGB. This one's giving it to me in hexadecimal, which I'll come back to. Uh, let me look over here. Colortools.net. Color mixer. Here we go. RGB. Two hundred that's funny. Okay, so RGB is one way to uh, define your colors. And here's another way. If I uh, add another background color property to the same selector, this time with the pound symbol, one, two, three, four, five, six. This is a color formula. But it's not that it's the 123rd thousandth color. It's not that I'm writing this as a number between 1 and whatever. This is a very interesting way to write colors. We have uh, color names. We have RGB color. We have hexadecimal color. Just shorten it to hex color. <coughs> Our color formulas here. We can mix any color with the right combination. This is a color formula too. This is the complex one. This is the one that, again, I've been doing this 15 years. I don't have. I don't think in hexadecimal colors. It's it's still too weird for me. So, don't forget the semicolon there. Uh, this color. Let's see what color it is. It's a.
kind of a cool blue. Page 249, hex codes. These are six-digit codes that represent the amount of red, green, and blue in a color, preceded by a pound sign or hash mark. So it's a pair of numbers, 12, 34, and 56, R, G, B. Some amount of red, some amount of green, some amount of blue. 12 units of red, 34 of uh, green, and 56 of blue. So RGB, red, green, blue, red, green, blue, but in a different, in a different scale, hexadecimal, which means 16, base 16. So I could write 0, 1, um, AA, 14. This is the one that's confusing, very confusing, because it also uses letters, not just numbers. It uses uh, letters from A through F. Actually, A, B, C, D, E, F, that's a valid number. That's a valid number, a valid color. That's a little too deep than I want to get into right now. You should look it up to find the whole gory details. But uh, this is just another way to represent numbers. Base 16. That's why definitely it's, it's a lot better to go to these color generating sites. Because if I want the perfect color, that color right there, it's telling me you can use RGB 37, 182, 172, or hexadecimal. 25B6AC. That's that color. And then also HSV. Yes. If you put the like hashtag the hex hexadecimal style in the CSS, will it work? It uh, it should. That's that's what I've got here. I am using the hex color, so it should work. Yes. Okay. So it works in both. Mm-hmm. So here I've defined background color three times. The third one takes precedence, of course. It's just in order. Here I've got color name, RGB color formula, or hex color formula. Definitely find a website with a color, uh, some sort of color mixer that you like, and get your color there. Because, again, to figure out what a color is in your mind is very difficult. We've looked at uh, color, background color, a lot. Uh, it doesn't matter if you use the same sort of way all the time. It matters a little bit more, maybe aesthetically, that I want it to be the same my, for my own, you know, personal enjoyment. So I personally, most of the time, in a project, I'm using hexadecimal. But once in a while, I do use a color name. But the problem with color names is it's limited to about 114 names. There are more than 114 colors. So most of the time, I am using hexadecimal because I can make a formula of the exact color I need. So like white and black, more than likely, you just exactly. Out, right? Exactly. If I want to make black text really fast, I just write black instead of the formula, which is a little bit more typing. Page 251 and 252 are really good pages for you to look at because they under, they talk about understanding color. They talk about RGB, the, the theory of it, and hex, and color names, and all of that. So for example, medium aquamarine is a color name which is then represented by the RGB value of 102, comma 205, comma 170, and the hex number 66 CDAA. It talks about hue, saturation, and brightness. Hue is generally the color, red, yellow, whatever. Saturation is how much gray there is in the color, and brightness is how much black there is in the color. 
color theory. This is a talk about uh, contrast. When picking foreground and background colors, it's important to ensure that there's enough contrast for the text to be legible. I already changed it, but remember a while ago when I had white text on a yellow background, it was very hard to read. There wasn't enough contrast. So we think in terms of background and foreground. Background is obviously everything behind everything. Purple background. Foreground are elements on top, in the fore, in the forefront. So the book talks about there, low contrast, you have white text on a gray, on a light gray background, very hard to read. Uh, medium contrast is white on a darker gray, and high contrast is white on black. Uh, very good contrast is also the opposite, black text on a white background. That's our whole book, almost every page, black text on a white background. This is the classic, traditional, most readable contrast, black text, white background. So when we start off as web designers, we always want to be really cool. We want to put the coolest color of all, black, behind everything, and it looks really nice. But then it's hard to read. If you've got blue on black, it's hard to read. So here we want to think about contrasts in colors. We've got a really cool thing we can do here, page 254. Opacity. We can make things transparent. So let's say I want to make some transparency. This color, I want to be able to see through it to see the background color. We have a an opacity property. Two ways to do it. So let's say for our paragraphs, these paragraphs that we've been playing with, I've set a background color, a text color. If I add another property here, opacity. The opacity property allows you to specify the opacity of an element and any of its child elements. The values go between 0 and 1. How many numbers are there between 0 and 1? That's almost, that's almost like a trick question. Infinite. Because between 0 and 1, you have 1 half. Between 1 half, you have 1 quarter. Between that, you have 1 eighth, 1 sixteenth. 1 20th, 1 200th. We have infinite number of numbers between 0 and 1. So think about it in terms of 100%. If we write opacity of 0, this element is invisible. So the opacity is 0, no visibility. The um, opposite of that, then, is 1, full visibility. And then we can choose any value in between, 0 0.5, half visible. So look at that. I'm, I'm going through the scene through it. Nice. This, uh, I wouldn't bother with doing something like 5.2. That is so minuscule difference. You often want to go in units of 10, 0.5 to 0.6. And even that, I don't bother with that too much. Personally, I really only bother with the big values of quarters. 25% visible, 50%, 75%, 100. Everything in between might be so subtle you don't really notice it. You know it's different, but no one else is going to notice the difference. Well, I like how that color is very nicely light and transparent. But what else is happening? Can't read it. Can't read it. The text is also becoming transparent. That's what this just said in the book here. This allows you to specify the opacity of an element and any of its child elements. So the text inside of that paragraph also becomes, changes its opacity. So opacity oftentimes doesn't work that well. Opacity 
works with uh, maybe images, but oftentimes it also does this. I just wanted to change the background color of this element. Now everything inside of it changed. I'm going to comment out opacity. A way to make things transparent. Oftentimes doesn't work too well. A better way is to use RGBA. So opacity may work. If it does for you, great. Usually it won't. A better way is going to be RGBA. RGB, RGBA. Red, green, blue plus alpha. There's your transparency. If I do 200, comma 0, comma 25, comma, here's the power I can do from 0 to 1, point 0 0.5. seeing through that color, 25% visible, and the text has not been affected. Transparency. RGBA. A is alpha. This is the fancy way of saying transparency. So A alpha. And it's a percentage, 0 to 1. Now it's got transparency. The book mentions there's another way to do color, HSL. We have RGB and there's HSL. I hardly use HSL, but you could look at that. Page 255. HSL also has a way to do transparency, HSLA, alpha. You can look at page 256, and the chapter ends. It will end the lecture at this point. We've talked about, started to talk about the concepts of CSS. What's the, what's the type of selector we have? We've started to look at the anatomy of things, properties and values, specificity, cascading, playing with color a little bit. When we come back, we'll look at even more CSS. Many of these chapters coming up are going to be, here's the right code to accomplish what you're trying to do. So um, any questions on the chapters we looked at today? Again, you should look at them in more detail. I'm not reading it word for word. You should look at it on your own. And next time, chapter 12, we'll talk about text, how to change fonts and such. So I want to learn that right away. I want, I'm tired of looking at that boring font in, uh, in my website. I want a nice cool font. That'll be next time, page 264.